right. All right, so we are starting to record. So I'd like to introduce Jackie Algon, and she's the chair of our or co-chair of our conservation committee. And she's going to talk to us today about invasives. And I think that's something that we're all really interested in and excited to learn about. And Jackie's definitely an expert. So take it away, Jackie. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I, I would like to clarify a little bit. I, um, I am a master gardener, but that does not mean that I'm an expert. And if anyone has any uh, comments that they want to make as we're going along about things that they know or have experienced themselves, uh, I would welcome that because I don't know everything by any means. So um, please feel free to chime in as we go along. We're going to try and keep this to about an, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. So I'll probably be sort of speeding along, but I uh, first want to thank uh, Ana Yupetal Agura for having helped me a lot with the, um, with the graphics. So <clears throat> How's that? That looks good. Beautiful. Pretty good. I see some heads. Beautiful. Okay, so thank you, Anna. So I sort of named this as a joke, uh, kicking the invasives habit. Not that any of us have welcomed all these invasives onto our property, but in fact, some people, uh, and as you'll learn as we go along, uh, have brought them in because many of them are quite beautiful and were originally brought in as, as uh, ornamentals. So the questions that I'm going to try and cover this morning are what they are and why, that why do we care and how do we get rid of them and where have we got them and which ones can we use to replace them. And uh, in terms of where they are, if you look at this globe, well, we're talking Excuse about- Excuse me, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like somebody still has their audio uh -oh. on. Uh-oh. Yes. Bird song could, and walking. Yeah. Uh -oh. Somebody could be sure to turn off their audio. Okay. Great. <laughs> I think there's still a couple, somebody else must have it on. So if you could turn off your audio, that'd be great. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, Jackie. So we're really talking about um, North America from our perspective right uh, today um, and where these plants that we're calling invasives have come from. And many of them were brought to our country um, as ornamentals. They were, um, they were originally a, a big deal in the 19th century. There was a lot of uh, enthusiasm for bringing in exotics and creating specimens in your garden. So. Uh, collectors in particular were importing um, a lot of these plants uh, to have in their gardens and from many cases they escaped. Uh, but there are also some, exp some uh, plants that came in through other means, meaning uh, for example by accident, uh, stilt grass was used to wrap up porcelain uh, from China and when it got here uh, it, it escaped. And uh, other plants have been uh, used as ballast in ships. And when the ships arrived, uh, so, did, so did the plant and the plant established itself. So what do we care? Why are they a problem? Well, the first thing is that they're usually the first plants that emerge in the spring. And they, um, they can squeeze out all of the natives that are in the area and they can use up the available nutrients in, in the soil as a result. And uh, they take up um, the space as well as the nutrients and they shade out the natives um, and prevent them from being able to photosynthesize. It, it happens that um, many insects and birds rely on the native plants. Their chemistry has evolved along with these plants to enable them to eat those plants. And while lots of us are looking for plants in our gardens that can't be eaten by insects, uh, the fact of the matter is that when they are eaten by insects, it's a good thing because in fact, they will then thrive and uh, we, we want them to thrive. For one reason, um, 
the insects provide food <coughs> for the birds. And the birds provide uh, song and beauty uh, for all of us and also food for their predators. And so the point is that if we don't have the, ho the host plants in our environment, then we're not gonna have the insects. They can't adapt to these newcomers. And when we say newcomers, we're talking about several hundred years or even more in some cases, but they're still considered not native to our area. And when we don't have them in our environment, that means that we don't have enough pollination going on to provide us enough food. This is a, a photo that was done by the Xerxes Society a number of years ago, where they went into a Whole Foods and they took a picture from above of the various um, counters of fruits and vegetables. And on the left is a list of just some of the various fruits that are pollinated by bees. And you can see in the lower picture that if you take away those, um, those fruits and vegetables, uh, because you don't have enough pollinators, that leaves very little in the food chain. So the question is, who, um, who makes these decisions about, <coughs> about which plants are invasive? And um, the SIPWIG, which is the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group, was set up a number of years ago. It was um, not an official group uh, in terms of um, the government, but it's a knowledgeable group of um, folks from, um, you can see the, the state, uh, the government, um, researchers and uh, educators and so on, who um, participate and keep an eye out and monitor for these various plants and meet periodically and also have conferences periodically <clears throat> for me to introduce information about the various invasives. And they have put together a list of the invasive plants and they've also got a very, very excellent website, which um, I'll show you more about that later, um, that will help people under understand these invasive plants and give them information and details about how to take care of them and get rid of them. <clears throat> this is part of their website in, in just one place. And you can see the kinds of um, uh, uh, information that you can get from them here. There are fact sheets, there are um, lists of um, invasive plants, and um, they have books of pictures so that you can identify them carefully. They offer plant walks so that you can go out and um, actually see them with an expert and so on. But the fact sheets I think are really important. And if you have a question about a plant that you've got in your, uh, on your property, you can take a piece of it and go into your computer, bring up the uh, SIPWIG website and go to, their, um, go to their fact sheets and get the sheet that, that looks like it's gonna match and actually do a little research for identification. The other option is to send a picture of it to your extension center. The Master Gardener programs are very, very helpful for identifying plants. So uh, what we're gonna talk about next is how to get rid of these guys. Um, and uh, there are a number of ways that we can go about it. You can, of course, pull them out by hand. And some of them you can pull when they're young some of them you can pull when they're not young, when they're mature, um, but a lot of them become very difficult to pull after they get um, full grown. You can burn, and I have a little bit of information about burning in Wilton that I would like to share. It is permitted, you have to get a permit from the, um, from the fire department, and they're good for uh, a week. And uh, they cost $15, you get them from the fire marshal's office. And then you have to be very careful about when you decide you're gonna burn something, of course. And you can burn between 10 a.m. and 5 a.m. and you wanna do it on a sunny day or a partially sunny day with the wind between five and 10 miles an hour. So, I mean, all of this is sort of common sense, but it's very, very easy for a fire to get out of control, particularly as you get toward fall or if we're in a drought condition. Um, and you can only burn things that have a diameter that is less than three inches. So um, 
If you're burning brush, then it, it would be shrubs and vegetation or prunings, but it doesn't include leaves and grass and things like that. So the other options are to wrench them out if you have a, a weed wrench um, or a, a shrub wrench. From what I understand, I've never used one, but I understand that they're not easy to use. And as your shrubs get well established and have formed a mat in the ground, it's not easy to get them out. You might need to get a professional to help you with that. You can cut them down and you can keep cutting them down as they try to re-sprout year after year. You can get biologicals in some cases. There is a lot of research going on to find biological controls for some of these invasives, which means bringing in some of the pests that they didn't bring with them when they came here, um, or some other pests that um, will eat them, but exclusively them. And then uh, what that means with a biological is that you can't actually eradicate it entirely. You have to have a little bit there to be able to sustain the biological control. So you're going to always have a little bit of the bugs around and you'll have a little bit of the, of the plant around. The best thing is to start eradicating it as soon as you see it and don't wait till they get established. And then once they're established, it kind of depends on their life cycle as to when the best time is to get rid of them. So let's talk a little bit about specifics of um, how to get rid of them. Oh, I, I did want to Okay, that's, a, that's gone. Um, air drying. Um, if you get them before they flower and you pull them out with their roots, you can leave them on site and then you can put them in your compost when they're dead and uh, completely dried. If you chip them, if, if these are for trees and shrubs and woody vines, um, then you should do it when they're not flowering or after they've flowered. And you can use the chips as mulch um, or you can add them to your compost when they're fully dead and dried. But if they're flowering and they're po or post flowering, then you shouldn't be chipping them and you shouldn't put them in your compost. Oh, you, you should shrimp, chip, you should chip, but not compost. You can leave them on site and you should watch what they're doing. Uh, not every day, but keep an eye on them. Um, you can construct brush piles um, to create habitat and that you would want to do a, a little way away from your living environment because uh, brush piles in, in creating habitat invite uh, small mammals and rodents such as um, mice and the deer, uh, the deer-footed mice, as everyone knows, um, is part of the life cycle for ticks. So you don't want to have those too near where you're, where you're going to be playing or you're going to be uh, working outdoors. But at the edges of your property, perhaps if you have some woodland behind you, that's a great place to, to add some uh, brush piles. And if they were flowering or if they're after flowering, then you wanna cover them up so the birds don't take the seeds and move them around. We um, talked about burning them and, um, and you can do that uh, while they're flowering or after they're flowering. And, and bag them and take them to an incinerator uh, if, if there has if we have one that you can get to um, and you can use them as firewood uh, after the, uh, they've flowered or when they're flowering but you can't take them anywhere else so if you have a second home for example and that's got a nice fireplace and you've got uh, these trees that you or shrubs that you're chopping down in Wilton don't take them to your other home because moving firewood can bring in any insects and start an infestation in the new environment. So you wanna be sure to leave them where they are. Um, in terms of vines, you can cut them near the ground and then leave them hanging in the trees. Don't try to pull them down because you'll disturb and uh, tear up the branches of your tree and um, harm the leaves. And after a couple of years, the vine will actually dry up and fall out of the tree. And if you have large stumps, they may often try to re-sprout. So if you do, then you're gonna to need to have some help in getting those uh, stumps out and you'll need to get an expert. What's happening here? <coughs> there. If you have herbace herbaceous invasive plants that you wanna get rid of, again, you can air dry them before they flower. 
You can do brush piles um, and you can uh, burn them, um, <clears throat> pardon me, and you can um, bag them and dispose of them in your trash. You should never put them in your compost when they have um, already gone to flower or after they have flowered because those seeds, um, the, the plant material itself may die off, but the seeds will still be viable. And uh, some, in some cases, some of these invasive species have seeds that are viable for five to 10 years and you're dealing with them popping up in your compost. And then when you put the compost into your garden beds, suddenly you've got all these other uninvited friends coming along. <clears throat> also, uh, the plants that um, reproduce by rhizomes or stolons or lateral root buds uh, or tubers uh, should not go into your compost because they can restart with just a fragment of, of your root. And I, I've listed a few of them here. Um, I particularly uh, have a vendetta going right now with goutweed in my garden. I got it about three years ago and I, I thought, oh, isn't that a pretty leaf? And I didn't bother to go and check it. And then it flowered and I thought, oh, this is not so bad. It's a very pretty little plant. And now I've got it in a huge section of my yard and it's eagerly trying to march itself all over the property. So um, if you pull them out, the problem is that you've now got these little bits of uh, root running around here and there and they pop right back up again the next year. So get them when they're, when they're first showing up. And if you're not sure what they are, then get someone to help you identify them and get them out of there while they're easy to get out. If you've got uh, grasses or sedges that are going crazy, um, that are invasives, you can air dry those before they flower and you can bag them and throw them away. You should again, not put those in your compost and um, <clears throat> take really good care with the ones that have rhizomes again. And you'll notice a lot of us have miscanthus, and uh, that's one of the ones that's a bad guy. And yellow flag iris, which, as many of you know, is uh, a plant that likes to grow near uh, marshes and can get into waters and become extremely invasive in the waters. So what about in Wilton? Where do we, what have we got here? Well, here's a, a mini list <laughs> of what we've got in Wilton right now. And I'm sure everybody knows garlic mustard. And uh, many of us have been pulling it by the hands full. I think Anna's had the biggest experience of anybody. Do you want to talk about your experience, Anna? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, my computer froze up, so I didn't get a real uh, precise summary of it. But this year, um, we came back from Florida in mid-March and discovered that we were all uh, sort of under lockdown. So uh, from March 15th through the end of April, over that period of six weeks, um, I spent probably about 45 hours pulling garlic mustard from our 2.3 acres and uh, some of the adjoining properties around us. And I take this very seriously because we live upslope from the Marble Van Halwen uh, Nature Preserve. And I sort of see it as, as a mini mission to try and prevent things from jumping over the stone wall between us and that land. Um, and garlic mustard was getting very close. So um, about six weeks, about 45 hours, and uh, we estimate, my husband Wayne and I, that I probably pulled between 10,000 and 12,000 plants in that time. Mm. And my takeaway from that is first, we can do this. A 65 year old woman in so-so shape 2.3 acres plus my neighbors was at least two and a half acres, uh, which had a lot of garlic mustard on it everywhere. And um, I got the second years out. Um, they had, they were already up on March 15th. And um, I got them out uh, towards the end. Some of them were blooming. In fact, many of them were blooming. So now they're bagged because you can't really take blooming garlic mustard in as as Jackie, you had said, compost it or really do anything with it. You have to save those seeds from uh, landing on the ground because it, it, it multiplies by seeding. Um, my takeaway from my experience is invasives work is the perfect thing to do outside. The perfect way to get outside and do an early spring before your normal yard work. 
March and April this year was perfect because no snow in the low 40s part of the day. <clears throat> uh, it's too early to work the gardens anyway. No bugs. Um, <laughs> no mosquitoes, flies, gnats. As for ticks, they say insects uh, become active around 50 degrees. So I hung my hat on that. And as far as I know, I've not been bitten by a tick. Um, and invasives generally get too green too early. So if you're out there and everything's brown and you see something is green in March, it's easy to spot and it's probably invasive. Uh, also, it's a great chance to get out there and do a nature walk on your property. Getting acquainted with the spring ephemerals. I found partridge berry, uh, spotted wintergreen, trout lily, wood anemone, swamp dewberry, skunk cabbage, Christmas fern, pyrola americana, Pennsylvania sedge, um, I think it's called sessile leaf bellwort, Canada mayflower, spice bush, small salmon seal. Um, it inspires you and re reinvigorates you, at least it, may, it did me to think these humble little natives and all their brethren are what I'm doing all this for. And it gave me energy to keep going. Another thing that gave me energy to keep going during these two to four hour sessions was um, when I got really bored, it's boring, start to count. And it helps you get a metric. And, um, and that's how I sort of ended up with a metric of 10 to 12,000 plants. So that's what I had to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're an inspiration to all of us. I, I tend to pull the second year garlic mustard because I'm a lazy gardener and I don't have to bend over down to the ground to get the first years. And I'll show you those in a few minutes. So the second year, you can just sort of lean over and pull them up and if you can get them out by their roots. And they do come out pretty easily if the ground is moist. Um, others that are on here, we, I'm not going to read them all to you. I think you've all been looking at the um, at, at this um, <clears throat> chart, but I would like to ask you about poison ivy. What about poison ivy? Is that an invasive? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is no, it's not an invasive. It's a native, and it does produce berries that um, are actually uh, very high in fat <clears throat> that the birds need, especially during migratory season. So while it is a real pest for all of us, um, because it uh, makes us quite miserable, um, it is something that is in our gardens and should be left there if it can be. If you have to get it out because you're highly allergic, get someone to help you to do it. Um, but absolutely under no circumstances should you ever burn it because it uh, vaporizes and it can <clears throat> actually affect your entire body. And I'm sure most of you already know that. So now I'm gonna introduce you to who these guys are. <clears throat> and um, just need to get to where we are here. Um, the first of these then is garlic mustard. And um, mm. garlic mustard has a high shade tolerance and therefore um, it can invade high quality wooded areas and it can form dense stands and crowd out the, the native understories. You can see the first, um, the first year is a basal rosette and it looks a lot like a violet, except that it's got a very bright green sort of wrinkled leaf. And then in the second year, it, has, it sh shoots up a bolt and it starts putting out all these little flowers. And as I understand it, the flowers, um, can carry up to about a thousand seeds, I think, per flower mm -hmm. and um, or per, per stem. And the seeds are viable for about seven years. So if you don't get them out, you're gonna have in no time a, uh, a picture in your yard that looks like, uh, like this with all, all of them in a big sequence. <coughs> They're native to Europe. They were introduced in the 1800s for medicinal and culinary uses. And people do eat them uh, when they're young um, and that's a good way to uh, sort of get back at them. <laughs> if you eat them, then, um, I don't, but they are garlicky. And uh, from what I understand, they're perfectly edible. And um, this is mugwort. Mm. Mugwort um, or artemisia uh, is also called wormwood. And um, it is an herb. It's um, a native of the beaches of Northeast Asia, 
and uh, Alaska. And it was used uh, to uh, produce the bitter flavor in beer before they had hops. Um, and then it grows in, undis in disturbed sites and in meadows and fields. And the leaves are alternate. And if you look at them, it's really a very distinctive leaf. It's uh, very highly lobed, uh, deeply lobed. And in the middle of this picture, you see some poor little violets trying to um, poke their way through this stand of mugwort. And the poor things are really crowded out um, by the mugwort coming up. The best thing about mugwort is to get it when it's young. It's very easy to pull when it's young. Once it gets established and it becomes mature, it's a lot harder to get it out of the ground. Um, and then of course it starts to form patches as, as it um, creates these mats. This is Forget-Me-Not. Everybody loves Forget-Me-Not. Um, <coughs> Garden Club have had uh, issues with <coughs> Forget-Me-Not with our plant sale for years because there is a native and it's, um, it's called Myosotis laxa that is uh, similar to this, but not quite the same. The flowers are much smaller. And uh, these are sky blue with yellow center. And uh, this is Myosotis scorpioides. It came from Europe and Western Asia. And, um, and it looks so much like our native that it's easy to mistake. Hey, Jackie. It. Jackie, sorry to interrupt. There's a few people who haven't muted themselves. If you guys could mute yourself, unless you have a question. Okay. I think it's Denise, Gerland, Lila. Okay. I you have uh, trouble computer. finding the mute button. It's yeah, the mute on. button's down in the bottom left if you're on a regular computer. Looks but like if you can. Yeah, looks like a microphone. If you can't, no problem. But go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Thanks. Um, the forget-me-nots grow <clears throat> in stream sides and in wet soil and in shallow water. They have angled stems and, and not the round stems of the native. So that's one way that you can distinguish them. And as I said, the, uh, the native has very tiny flowers. Um, you can see that uh, this flower has always got five petals. This guy is Japanese knotweed. Um, it's also um, called false or Mexican bamboo. Uh, it grows from six to 13 feet high and it has a bushy appearance, but that's because um, it's got a crowd of stems that are <clears throat> near each other. Uh, the plants get killed by the frost um, and they turn a kind of copper color when they do. But unfortunately, they re-sprout and they have a rapid growth in the spring. And the stems are hollow and they're stout and bamboo-like so that they have rings of little tub tubular um, sheaths where the leaves are attached. So you can recognize them. They have a sort of purpley stem. You can see here in the smaller picture here. And you see them coming up. Uh, one day they may be about this high and the next day they're about this high and the next day they're this high and in no time at all they're six feet long and uh, or six feet tall and, and you're sort of out of luck. People have had a, a lot of um, different things that they've tried to get rid of uh, Japanese knotweed. You can see that it's very prolific in terms of flowering though most of the seeds are not viable. So mostly it spreads by its rhizomes and from what I understand, the stems can be up to 40 feet long and they can actually go underneath a road. And in some cases they can come up in the cracks in the road. So um, it's, it's really hard to control this plant. Um, the, the best things that I've heard for it is to mow it three times a year, once in the spring when you first see it coming up, again in around July, and then again late in, in the uh, summer maybe around the end of August. And do that for three or four years and you'll eventually wear out the roots and they'll say, I'm just not gonna make it and they'll give up. On the other hand, nobody has ever seen um, an effective um, eradication of knotweave for 10 years. So even if you think you've gotten rid of it, it may pop up again later. Um, one thing you can do because of its, uh, its whole, um, 
this hollow stem, is that in the fall, when it's drawing back all its energy into the root system, you can cut it off and then drip um, a chemical herbicide into each of the stems. Now, as a pollinator pathway person, I'm not supposed to be, and as a master gardener, I'm not supposed to be advocating the use of chemicals. But even Sipwig recommends chemicals for this plant. There is apparently no other way to really effectively get it. What you don't want to do is to um, spray it because, of course, then you're going to kill off everything that's around it as well. So it, it's a very intensive, uh, labor-intensive process if you are going to do that. But you need to do it at the right time. There's no point in doing it while it's still growing. And in the fall is the best time to do that. It was originally brought in um, as uh, an ornamental and also to control erosion. But in fact, and that was in the late 1800s, but in fact, it turns out that it can uh, cause erosion. So um, it's really not a good guy. And uh, when you see it in your neighborhood, wherever you see it, the next year you're going to see it closer to your home because it's moving along at a great rate. This is purple loose strife. Um, I'm sure all of us have seen it along the roads. It, um, it, uh, it invades the wetlands and it outcompetes the natives. It creates dense stands of, um, of uh, plants and reduces the habitat for waterfowl and it clogs the waterways and disrupts the nutrient cycling. And eventually it can actually get rid of the wetland. So it just, you end up with first a, like a marsh and then you end up with a field of these guys. It's a perennial herb and it has a square woody stem. It's not a mint as far as I know. It can grow to four to, from four to 10 feet tall. And um, it has um, uh, sort of lance shaped leaves and, uh, and this magenta flower through most of the summer. It was introduced in the 1800s as an ornamental, and then it was accidentally, um, and, and it was also brought in accidentally and then thrown away, and the next, um, after it came in on ship ballast, and the next thing you know, it was all over the place. It has a high number of flowering stems on each plant, and it can have up to two to three million seeds a year on each plant. So it can reproduce also by underground stems uh, at a rate of a foot a year. So you're talking about a guy that really moves along here. Oriental bittersweet was brought in as an ornamental also um, from China in 1860. And um, this is a vine. And it, as we all recognize um, in this picture on the left here, it girdles the trees and eventually it will kill the tree that it, it girdles. Um, if you pull them when they're young, and you can see how they look, uh, this is um, a mature one, um, but when they're young, they have a very distinctive elliptical leaf that comes to a point. They're pretty much a bright yellow, uh, I mean a bright green leaf. And if you pull it out, you'll look at the stem and it's orange. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize it as, um, as oriental bittersweet. It's found on old home sites and in fields, <clears throat> on forest edges and roadways, near railroad tracks, and it prefers sun, but it can also tolerate shade. And when it gets up in the trees, um, it weighs a lot at that point, and it can break the trees if it doesn't first kill them by choking them. It can actually weigh them down and branches can break off. You can see it here all wrapped around itself and other things. And um, in, in the uh, summer, it produces masses of these, um, these red berries. And um, when I was up in Maine, when my kids lived in Maine, I saw people standing on the side of the road selling wreaths of these berries. Um, you know, it's easy to cut the vine and then just twist it and make this beautiful wreaths. A friend of mine once said to me, why don't we go get some of those and hang them on your uh, door for uh, a Christmas wreath? And I said, I'm not putting any oriental bittersweet on my property anywhere. 
even dead or alive, because all it takes is one berry and you've got it. This is porcelain berry. If you look at the berries, they're really quite beautiful. Um, they're sort of um, uh, opalescent and the leaves are very interesting shaped. They're highly lobed. They look a lot like grape leaves, the wild grapes. And so they're hard to tell apart. Uh, these came in from um, Japan and uh, Northern China around 1870 as a, an ornamental and as a landscaping plant. And you can see why they're really quite attractive. Um, it's a deciduous woody vine and it can climb to about 20 feet. And the alternate leaves um, are also sometimes heart shaped. Uh, the birds love this, uh, the fruits and they spread them to all kinds of new locations. So uh, the fruits can also be spread by water. It prefers moist, rich soils and full sunlight, but it can tolerate partial shade. So we're, um, it invades stream banks and forest edges and disturbed areas and any place that's not permanently wet. We never had it um, on Linden Tree Road until recently, and I now see it's down near Kent Pond. So we're gonna need to go down there and eradicate it. It grows quickly. It forms thick mats that, form, uh, that cover the, the natives, and um, it can climb up into the trees and shade out the natives. You can hand pull the vines in the fall or spring to prevent them from flowering. Um, and if you can't um, get them out, then you're gonna to need to cut them. It resembles our native grapes, as I said, but the porcelain, uh, porcelain berries pith is white and the wild grapes pith is brown, so you can tell them apart. A good replacement for them is a Virginia creeper, for example, or trumpet creeper. This guy, myelaminid vine, is now in Wilton. Um, it's also called Devil's Tear Thumb, and it's got a good name because you can see all these spikes on it. And on the leaves, down the center of the leaf, there are also curved um, uh, thorns that can tear up your hands when you're trying to pull it. So if you're going to work with this, you need to be sure and wear heavy gloves. Um, it's um, an annual weed and uh, is killed by the first frost, but it comes back again uh, the next year. It encircles um, this, this little guy right here, encircles uh, the stem. So it's a diagnostic for this uh, plant. And you can see it at each of the nodes. And the, uh, the new plants start coming up in late April or early May. It came in as boat ballast um, at uh, Portland, Oregon, but it's now spread all the way east and we have it now as well. If you look at the leaves, I tend to think of them as equilateral. They look like little spades and you can see them here. Can you see my, um, my uh, mouse going around here, my arrow? Yes. Okay, we see yeah. your cursor. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Jump to the next one. Yeah. Um, so the growth comes from overwintering seeds. Uh, and the, pro the problem with them is that they grow about six inches a day. And that's why they're called mile a minute. They form dense mats and that smothers the native plants. And since the birds and the rodents eat the fruit, you can get them um, breaking out in new uh, batches far from where they were originally seen. The best thing is mowing them um, or cutting them, but if you're gonna hand mow them, be sure that you do take protective uh, measures because you'll really tear up your hands. This is black swallowwort. And um, there's also a light swallowwort white or pale uh, swallowwort. Um, this came in as an ornamental uh, through uh, New York and Massachusetts and Illinois in about 1927, but actually um, earlier than that. It was seen in Pennsylvania in 1927. It came in in the 1800s. So you can see that a lot of these um, in, 
invasives have been here for a couple of hundred years already. And you'd think, well, doesn't that make them natives by this point? But the answer is no, because they really haven't um, adapted to um, our, in, our insects. So our insects can't eat these guys and they have no natural predators. And that's the problem with all of these invasives. When they came over, they didn't bring any of their, um, their pest buddies with them. They came originally from Europe and Eurasia. They're a perennial and they're, uh, they twine their way around herbaceous vines to two to three feet high. And um, they, they grow in clumps uh, and form extensive patches. They like limestone-based soils, so they're kind of alkalinic, and um, they have a wide range of moisture and light conditions that they can tolerate, with the exception of wet. They don't like wet soils. Um, and if you cut them, the root crown has uh, dormant buds and they can re-sprout. They uh, spread by uh, the fruits and, um, and these pods that you see. And um, they're related to milkweeds. So they're a real problem for our um, monarchs because monarchs, as you know, can only lay their eggs successfully on Asclepius. Um, and if they lay them on black swallowwort, then when, when the eggs uh, hatch out and you have the larvae, the little caterpillars come and eat the leaves, they'll die. Um, they, uh, they have to have Asclepius to, to live. So um, it's an easy enough plant for the monarchs to make a mistake and they can lose their young that way. Um, the species can be taken out by mechanical means. Um, uh, but the pods have to have been completed. Um, the pods have to have not shown up before you do this um, mechanical removal. Otherwise, the pods may get into the ground and, and uh, re-sprout. Um, there are lots of native species that you can use instead, including honey vine and various other vines that we talked about. Um, they do recommend using herbicides to control this one, but as with any herbicides that you're going to use, you have to be very, very careful when you're doing it. And you probably should get um, a professional to do it if you have to, because uh, you don't want to spray when um, the pollinators are in the area. And it, um, the timing is extremely crucial. If you uh, spray them early, um, then uh, they're just going to grow because you have to spray when they're effective on the plant and uh, when, when the bees and other, butter, uh, other pollinators are not in the area. Question, Jackie, sure. about the black swallowwort, mm -hmm. what, time, uh, what time of the year does it bloom? I think, let's see if I can find something that says. I don't know, I'll have to look it up for you. I don't see it on um, the fact sheet as to when they bloom. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'll find out an answer and I can email all of you. The next guy is Japanese uh, honeysuckle. And um, This, um, this guy produces masses of very fragrant white flowers and they're distinguished from the native, which has the dark purple flower, uh, dark purple berries. It was introduced in 1806 as an ornamental and uh, the birds disperse the seeds around. It grows in disturbed habitats and at the forest edge and in forest meadows and in fields and shrublands and thickets. Um, and uh, the edges have no lobes or teeth, so you can recognize it. The leaves are green all winter, and it grows as a vine. 
Excuse me, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Wayne here. I just checked on the Connecticut Botanical Society. They say black swallowwort flowers between June and September. Ah, good. Thank you. It's a long period. Okay. Now we're up to Japanese stilt grass. This came in originally and uh, it was uh, verified and documented in Tennessee in 1919. Uh, almost a little over a hundred years ago. And it was an accident, as I said earlier, it came in um, as packing material for uh, Chinese porcelains. And it came from Asia, obviously, uh, for Chinese porcelains, and is an annual. And it, it uh, grows from one to three feet high. Everybody's got it in their gardens at this point, I think. And all of us think, well, it's not too hard to pull. But when you get a stand of it like this, um, it can get pretty daunting. The one thing you can do is mow it repeatedly and that will help uh, control it. It's been recognized as bamboo-like the way it grows and it probably is similar to bamboo in that respect. It's got these lance-shaped uh, narrow leaves and um, a silvery stripe on the top. I think you can see it on this leaf right here and right here. Oop, sorry keep clicking and it's jumping, sorry. Uh, so you can recognize it. Um, and it has flower spikes that come out in September. And um, it can crowd out native plant species and they can, that can change the nutrient cycling um, and uh, uh, inhibit the tree survival and growth because of the nutrients that are taken away and it reduces the light availability to the, the plants beneath it. It uh, reproduces entirely by seed. So uh, one plant can produce 100 to 1,000 seeds and they fall close to the parent. And then they can be carried away by water uh, during heavy rains or they can move around um, in contaminated hay or in soil or mud. And, or even stuck to your, to your boots when you're out in the garden and, and go from place to place. They can stay viable in the soil for five, uh, five or more years. So as I said, um, hand pulling and mowing should be done um, in this late summer when the plants are just about to flower. So you wanna do that before they flower. This is the common reed or Phragmites. A lot of us have this, uh, if we have any ponds, you'll see it at the pond edges. It grows very tall, up to 15 feet, and it has these big plumes of um, seeds at the top. Um, and the rhizomes form a dense mat. The, um, if you see the wetlands in New Jersey as you're driving up Route 95 um, along, um, where is that? I would say around um, northern New Jersey on Route 95, and there's wetlands on both sides of the road. Um, the Phragmites have basically taken away all the wetlands. There's almost no water left, and you have these enormous mats of, um, of these plants just standing in colonies. Uh, they're wind dispersed. Um, seeds and the fragments of the rhizomes can also be washed um, into some new locations to start new stands. It was introduced in the late 18th, 19th centuries and um, it came in as um, contaminated ballast material for boats, for ships. It came from Eurasia and it's um, an old world genotype of the common reed. So the problem is that it has also cross hybridized with the common reed. So it, you really don't know which ones anymore the invasive and you pretty much need to treat them all as invasives. They grow in tidal and non-tidal brackish water and in freshwater marshes and in ponds and roadsides and disturbed areas. And they like it sort of salty. You can cut them and pull them. You can mow them um, in late July to get rid of most of the food reserves in the plant so they don't flower as well. 
And you can also smother them with black plastic. So if you mow them down and, um, and either solarize them or put black plastic over them, uh, that may help to, um, to, to kill them off. Um, and you have to cut all the shoots um, to prevent them from re-sprouting. This is everybody's favorite. This is uh, Euonymus alatus, the winged bur burning bush. Um, it's a very beautiful plant. It was clearly brought in um, because of its, um, of its ornamental value. It has beautiful red foliage in the fall and it makes it a, a, a very popular plant that is still being sold in many nurseries, even though it is on the list came in from Asia around 1860. And it threatens a variety of habitats because it forms uh, forests uh, and fields and uh, uh, coastal scrubland uh, thickets. And um, birds, of course, eat the berries and they spread the, the seeds throughout the, the wetlands or the uh, forest. And um, it, it's adaptable to almost any kind of environment, so it grows well in different soil types and different pHs. It doesn't have any um, serious pests, and that helps it um, take, take um, root and stay viable. It looks a lot like a blueberry, which is a great um, substitute for it. And there's also sweet gum, and um, it has a winged um, branch as well that you could use. If you like the branching uh, habit of this plant, you can see it here. It sort of looks like little corked wings on it and you can see it better in this picture. You can get rid of it um, with uh, mechanical means by weed wrenching it out if it isn't too big, or you may have to cut it down and then dig out the root um, the best way to get rid of it is not to plant it. So don't buy it, don't put it in. And then once you've got it, then you have to keep after it. You can pull the seedlings by hand. And um, if you need a professional, they may um, recommend using a herbicide, but that's up to you to decide. You can see the little berries coming up here. And the berries, of course, um, are very popular with the birds. This is multiflora rose and there's a, a variety of thinking about multiflora rose because with all these other things that we've talked about it can be overwhelming to try and get all of these out of your property if you have them. So you kind of have to pick and choose which are the ones that really are the most offensive. One of the good things about multiflora rose is that it does provide habitat for um, a variety of wildlife. And for me, it's, it was introduced to the East Coast in the US from Japan in 1866, and it was used as rootstock for ornamental roses. Um, it, it was also used to create living fences for, wild, uh, for livestock. So farmers would get it and they'd plant it and then use it as a barrier. And it's also used even as <clears throat> crash barriers on highways. It's a thorny perennial shrub. It has arching stems and of course the canes then reach down to the ground and replant themselves. So it sort of walks along your property in little jumps. It has uh, five to 11 sharply toothed uh, leaves as you can see here. Here's a good example right here. And um, it has a pair of fringed bracts. And I think you're gonna have to look at this right here in this node, if you look at it closely, you will see a little hairy growth. And that little fringed bract is the diagnostic for multiflora uh, rose. In uh, May and June, it gets clusters good of- Good morning, I'm good, how are you? It gets clusters of white flowers and- um, Hey Pam. I think that sounds like Pam. Are you outside? You need to mute. It sounded like Pam. Okay. Um, the go, best, go ahead. 
the, mes the best control for it is mechanical, uh, where you just uh, cut it, or chemical. And again, I'm recommending an awful lot of chem chemicals, and I really don't mean to give you that impression. I think you want to be extremely um, careful about what you decide needs to be removed chemically. And most of us don't use any chemicals on our property. And I would say that unless the multiflora rose is taking over your entire property, I would certainly not introduce chemicals for multiflora rose. Um, so you can think about it because it's, um, it is a plant that um, is widely available to all of us and uh, will come into your yard. I've got um, the native um, Rosa palustris growing. I put it in as a swamp milkweed, uh, a swamp uh, rose, and it's it's a tiny sort of tidy rose that grows very um, very nicely in my um, wetlands. And all of a sudden, I started seeing this very prolific shrub coming up next to it, and it it was multiflora rose, and it is multiflora rose. I haven't taken it out yet. But I think in order to get it out, I'm going to have to cut it. I would certainly not put a chemical on it. This is Japanese barberry. Um, again, like, like Euonymus, it was brought in as an ornamental. <clears throat> it was brought in in 1875 uh, from Japan and um, from Europe. Uh, there's a European barberry as well. Um, the picture on the left is a picture that I took just on Vista Road as I was walking uh, one morning with Ruth Ann. And I think this is the way it looks during most of the season. This red guy here is, is clearly the fall foliage. And that's why people brought it in because it was so lovely in the fall. This is full of thorns. And uh, as most of you know, uh, this is a uh, habitat for small mammals, small rodents. The white-footed mouse will also often live in, in the protected um, part of this plant under it and uh, near it because of the thorns that keep out its um, predators. But of course, the white-footed mouse brings in uh, and bears during its life cycle the, uh, the tick, the deer tick that brings us Lyme disease. So it's really important to get this out of your yard if you have it. Um, and um, the plant is uh, sensitive to fire uh, so you can burn it, um, and um, one way of burning it is with a torch, and you might need to get somebody in to do that for you um, because you could have a, you could create a problem if you don't do it properly in terms of having the fire get out of control. Um, but it, um, it's one of the first shrubs to leaf out in the fall, in the spring, and if you use thick gloves, you can probably pull it when it's young. Um, and then you have to dig up any plants that are larger. Um, you can't really mow it or cut it. Um, so uh, you're just gonna have to uh, do your best to get it out of there, but it's really important to get it out. If you have it on the edges of your property, it's probably not so bad um, in terms of, um, of your safety and your children's or pets safety, but you really don't wanna have it around um, in the, in the middle of your, uh, of your property where you're gonna be walking in and, uh, and the ticks can, can board you. This is the autumn olive tree. And I think because of time, I'm gonna not say much about it. It's very prolific along the roadsides. Um, and this is Norway maple. Most of us know more, uh, the Norway maple. Um, uh, it has, it looks like other maples, except that its leaves are much larger. And the problem with the Norway maple is that it was brought in as a street tree originally. And it, um, it has uh, so much density to the foliage that it shades out anything that can grow underneath it. So, and it also actually, I think, has an allele, allelogenic capability to pre prevent other things from growing underneath. So um, many of us have them on our property. If they should happen to die, that's a good thing. <laughs> and um, if you want to spend the money to get them off your property and replant them with, with native maples or oaks, that's really a much better choice. 
This is what could be coming to our neighborhood soon. This is kudzu. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to talk about it because it's not here, but I just thought it was an amusing uh, slide about, um, about invasives. And it's really no joke, in fact. And if you look at um, when you drive down the Sawmill Parkway, it used to be that, uh, and it is in some places along the sawmill, just covered in, in, a lot like this, where it's just covering all of the shrubbery that's native and, um, and uh, choking out all of, all of the natural habitat. Um, a group in Pound Ridge, started by Carrie Sears, who's a master gardener and was a science teacher, has started uh, their invasives program and they did it about, I don't know, maybe it's about 10 years old now, I think. And they have done an absolutely amazing job in Pound Ridge of eradicating natives. They go out on weekends as a group and, um, and cut and work together. And that's really the best way to get at it. I mean, if you're not working on your property and you want to help the community look better, that's a great way to do it is to start a little group and work diligently at it over time. It's not something you can do in a weekend. It's as Anna said, it took her 48 hours over a, a period of time of two hours or four hours a, a session. It's exhausting and it's, um, and it's uh, physically laborsome. So, um, but don't give up because it's really important. So if you're not gonna have natives, what should you use instead? Here's a list um, of replacements. And I'm very quickly going to go through and just show you some pictures um, to give you a sense of which ones are good guys. Um, and I'm happy to share this slide deck with anybody who wants it. Um, so the black gum on the native dogwood are really great replacements for the Bradford pear. Um, anyone who's heard Doug Ptolemy talk about um, uh, bringing nature home or nature's best hope, knows that he has um, a vendetta against the Bradford pear. In, in where he lives in Delaware, it's extremely prolific and it's quite lovely in the spring for about a week. And then its seeds blow all over the neighborhood. And the next thing you know is you have masses of these trees which are entirely useless to the wildlife. There isn't a single insect that can, um, can use these, these trees. Whereas for the not native dogwood, you have berries that the birds can use and um, that caterpillars can use. Same with the uh, black gum, you've got this beautiful red foliage or, or orange foliage in, in the fall. Uh, rather than having English ivy crawling up your house or pachysandra on your, as your ground cover, uh, we recommend the native wild ginger or maybe heuchera plants. This is the native violet, and I put this in here because I wanted to show you the difference between the violet leaf and the garlic mustard leaf. When you see them out in the yard, it's not that easy to tell them apart sometimes, but you can see that this is a deeper green and its leaf is shaped differently. It's a little bit more pointy and it is heart shaped. These guys um, have a split down here um, and it's more rounded and has um, a sort of wrinkly leaf and it's a much lighter green. Uh, we were selling Lonicera semperaverens, the American honeysuckle, I think last year at the um, plant sale, and I'm sure we'll do it again in the future. And it's a great uh, replacement plant for the Japanese honeysuckle. On the left, you see marsh marigold, and on the right is what's blooming all over the place right now, lesser celandine. Um, this came in, I think, from Holland. It's a very cheerful little flower, and it's hard to tell them apart. You can see that this is a shinier leaf, and it's a rounder leaf than this one, but it's really hard to tell them apart. The flowers, though, are distinctive. This has eight petals, and this has only, I think, six. Um, and the marsh marigold is really quite beautiful. Here's the Japanese bear, uh, um, barberry and some replacement recommendations are inkberry and bayberry, um, blueberries, all of those are good choices. And by the way, the low, um, the low bush blueberry is also a good 
uh, choice as a ground cover if you um, are pulling out your pack of Sandra. <coughs> I have some resources here <coughs> of where you can get the plant material. And of course, don't forget our garden clubs. <coughs> and you can see that we've actually developed quite a, a large uh, number of gardens that are nearby that are specializing in native plants. Earth Tones, Nature Works, uh, Rosedale is over near, um, near the Hudson River, but Earth Tones is just north uh, of us along uh, the Merritt. Nature Works as well, Broken Arrow as well. And uh, we have a new place called uh, Native, which is in uh, Fairfield. And all of these um, gardens are specializing in natives. And here's just a few um, of the uh, resources that you can go to for uh, reading more about any of these plants, especially the Xerxes Society, uh, re I recommend, and the Sipwig. <clears throat> Those are two really great resources. They have tons and tons of fact sheets and uh, information about all of these plants. So thank you. Um, remember, if you put in natives, you're going to get butterflies. <laughs> Anybody have questions? I probably bored you to death. I hope not. No, it was wonderful. Yeah, that was fantastic. Any that questions? was amazing. Well, good. Great. <laughs> wow, that was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Feels Jackie. Good. That was thank amazing. Oh. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's great. <laughs> All right. I, I, I actually have a question. Yeah. Other than getting on your hands and knees, this is Wayne, uh, and pulling out Pachysandra, has anyone figured a trick to get rid of the Pachysandra? Yes. Um, the way that I got it to put it in, unfortunately, when I was um, still a novice, was that you can dig down below the roots and then roll it up like a carpet. And then you just have to put it into a bag and get rid of it. Thank you. Yep. Jackie, I have I have a similar question up at Cape Cod. A neighbor had put in English ivy several years ago, and it jumped across the street. I can't. I have tried to pull it. I I don't know what to do. Is there something like vinegar and salt, or it's it, because over at the Cape, it just goes all through the winter, and it keeps on growing and spreading, and I pull and pull. It's all over the place, and I wish I could get rid of it. Do you know of anything? I don't, but I'll look it up. Oh, I, I, I heard somebody say salt and vinegar or I, I, something that doesn't hurt some of the other plants. It, it's hideous. It's all over the place. And it knocks out the, the, the natives. Yeah. Um, so is this Lila? Lila. Yeah, yes, it did. Okay. But sorry. So Lila, I'll look it up and I'll look I, I was caught. I had to switch computers. Thank you. I appreciate it. When I was a kid, yeah. the salt and vinegar thing kills pretty much any, you know. I mean, yeah, I don't, do you, do you, is there a, 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 a what part to what part of vinegar and salt or something? No? You, I don't know, but I'll check for you. That's um, the other great. thing is that um, it sometimes grows on the side of your house. Oh, I know. Um, when I was a kid, my dad was highly allergic to all ivies. And... Um, uh, my parents had to pull it off the, off the house. Well, they had to have somebody pull it off the house for them and get the entire yard free of it because you couldn't even walk out the front door without breaking out. Oh, and I know that uh, when, they, when you pull it off the house, if you have brick or even if you have wood, you're going to damage that surface. I know. So mm -hmm. it's really... I got it off that, but it's, it's crawled out towards the woods. And, it, and, you know, it just... Because it's warm in the winter, it keeps going under the yeah, leaves. Right. Well, and of huh. course, with, you know, with the changes in our climate, a lot of these plants mm. are going to thrive now. Yeah. It didn't do, uh, do well in this area. So um, we're going to have to learn new ways. Um, but I'll, I'll see what I can find for you, let you know. Thank you so much. If I, if I may, uh, we found the recipe a while ago. This is Wayne again. Uh, one yeah. gallon vinegar, two cups Epsom salt, and one quarter cup Dawn dishwashing liquid, your blue original. Uh, really? One, one pound? 
one cup, one gallon vinegar, two yep. cups apple salt, one quarter cup Dawn dishwashing liquid, the blue original. Ooh. It kills everything. And do you spray it? How do you apply? Do you spray it? Spray it like you would spray Roundup. Oh, great. Really? Oh, good to know. And it doesn't oh, kill it doesn't kill anybody else's around. Oh, it kills uh -huh. everything. Oh, well, how about everything. like under a tree? You know, out back in the woods, I have some you know um, native native trees out there. You know, viburnum. I have these wonderful native viburnums. I just wouldn't want to. I don't know. Don't no no. It will kill everything. Do not spray it anywhere where you have things you want to keep. Okay. All right. Good, thank you. Thank you. Jackie, I had a quick question. Um, yesterday I was at Town and Country and they are selling barberry bushes. Ugh. And are there several types? Might one kind not be invasive? Um, there, there are several types of barberries, but unfortunately they have cross hybridized. Ah. Um, I would not bring them into the yard. Okay. I wouldn't trust them. Okay. I'm wondering why they're selling it, though. Well, I mean, they're probably selling um, burning bush, too. I don't know if town and country is, but others are. And mm. so, uh, the Jackie? The thing you can do is complain. But so just don't even think of buying it. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't. Hmm. Uh, Anna here, yep. um, just to chime in about that. Uh, based on internet research, Apparently, unless the FDA or some other governmental organization forbids the sale of a certain plant, uh, nurseries are allowed to sell. So until it gets on an invasive or noxious list, um, you know, there's nothing stopping them. Well, I mentioned at That's the beginning all. that SIPWIG has this 100 plant list of things that are um, invasive in Connecticut. But as I also said, they're not an official organization. They were formed and they have all these experts working with them. And a lot of people do respect their opinions and their recommendations, but they don't have any clout because they're not really a, an organization under the government. Right. Unfortunately. Jackie? Okay. Yes, Mary. Uh, just a quick question on the um, uh, Star of David or Star of Bethlehem. They've popped up in the garden. And is there anything about it invasive that uh, wouldn't be good for it to be in the garden? Because I know it has good healing properties as a flower essence. I don't know. I did see something about that, but I don't remember what I saw. Does anybody know anything about it? I've, I've read, uh, again, on the internet that it is on some invasive species list. Anna here. Huh. I mean, the other thing is there are some plants that are on the potentially invasive list. Um, not all non-natives are invasive. I hope, I hope everybody got that point. Um, I don't think I made that point very clearly. So there are a lot of non-natives that are perfectly good plants in the garden. They behave themselves. They don't jump out of the garden and run all over the neighborhood. And um, the birds don't take them all over the place. So uh, this is not to badmouth all non-natives. <clears throat> the, the thing about the natives is that the wildlife have um, evolved concurrently with most of them. And those, uh, those plants serve as hosts, many of them. And a lot of the pollinators are <clears throat> Um, host specific. So if they don't have those hosts in their environment, then they can't grow there. And if they don't grow there, then you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have those insects. And then you won't have birds because they won't have anything to feed their young. One hmm. of the things that's really Excuse important me. About Barbara, these... Barbara Stilly, you're not muted. We hear you walking. Oh, oh, that was a run, actually. Here I go. I heard you running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that Barbara? I was wondering who that was. Thanks. Yeah, that's Thanks. the one with every invasive thing you ever spoke about in my yard, but I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this was wonderful. Hang on. All right. Yeah, that was great. Any, any more questions? We'll take one more question. I have a question. It's Anne. Yep. yep. Um, Jackie, 
we're trying to convert an area that was um, full of invasives into a meadow. And uh, we've been working on clearing that out for two or three years. Um, it started with knotweed and you're right, that was pretty horrible. It was almost an acre of knotweed and it took us six years to get wow. rid of it. Wow. Um, and eventually wow. the South Norwalk, the guys who, um, who take care of the reservoir here, I called them to make sure that it would be okay with them to use all of the, to use some products, you know, to ask if there were any good ways to get rid of the knotweed. And they said the problem was so severe that they said, go for it. Use whatever you have to do to get rid of it, even though it feeds onto the reservoir water. So, um, so it was very serious. Um, so we finally basically cleared the knotweed, but you're right, it keeps coming back. Even in areas that we haven't taken care of, it'll sprout up, you know, five, 10 feet away. Anyway, we're now finally converting that area to a meadow. And um, my husband is wondering about using what he calls in intense or concentrated vinegar on the area. And I'm worried about whether that'll seep into the soil and get the trees. What I would recommend for a big area is to solarize it. Yeah. If you take a clear, heavy plastic, you can buy these uh, rolls of heavy plastic and it's um, it's transparent you can see through it. it's like a window lay it down on on your area and cover the edges with um, little soil over the top so that nothing is able to get under it um, like air then it, and leave it for about um, two to six weeks it will burn up everything that's underneath it and that's really the best way to do it I think you can also do it with black, but the black takes a little longer. So if you have the black tarps, you can put those down and then, you know, just put rocks on them and, uh, and then give them a season. I mean, you've obviously been very patient to get, uh, in getting started and doing a great job. So I wouldn't rush it and really try to get the weed bank uh, cleared out as best you can. But I would, I would try the solarizing. And I have an article that I can send you um, about how to solarize. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, Jackie, thank you so much. This has thank been you. this has been fantastic. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, great. Jack. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Bye -bye. joining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right.